so good morning, everybody. Um, we have with us today our speaker, George Wurzel. George Wurzel has worn many, many hats. He's been a woodworker. He is a woodworker. He's been a horse trainer. He's been a countertop installer. He's been a construction manager and many other things that I have not mentioned that he will talk to you about. One of the things that we want to start with is George, within the last couple years, did a national commercial for Subaru. And he is the main actor and voice in the commercial. So we're going to play that commercial for you. And then he can give you a little more detail about how it was filmed. And uh, then he will move on to telling you about his very diverse life and careers throughout his life. All right, cue the commercial, please. Here we go. Does this map show the Peninsula Trail? The shopkeeper shakes his head. Peninsula Trail. You won't find that on a map. Says an old man in the back. I'll take you there. Walking with a white cane. The couple, skeptical at first, invite him into the back seat of their Subaru. You hungry? Me too. Take this left. They drive up to a rustic seaside diner. Now, don't eat just yet. They inhale the aromas. Next stop, a cliff overlooking the ocean. Feel the wind? If you listen real hard, you can hear the whales. Their arms extended. Back in the Subaru, then a hike after dark. This is my favorite part of the park. His cane strikes a log, and he steps over it. The woman trips over the log, then reaches her hand to the old man's shoulder. <laughs> they hike together. Just listen. Hear that? A white owl. Our Subaru Outback lets us see the world, <laughs> sometimes in ways we never imagined. All right. All right. Take it away, George. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I do not know how to mute my kitty cat, uh, who just walked That's around. okay. <laughs> and was meowing, but if you figure it out, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the, the Subaru, the Subaru commercial just kind of fell out of the sky. Um, I'm, I'm not a professional actor, never done anything in the professional acting business ever before. I, uh, I have been involved in documentary films here and there. Um, but, um, but the, this came about because the company who was putting, doing the ad, making the ad, they put out a casting call to all the casting agencies. And the casting call said they were looking for a blind gentleman between the ages of 55 and 75, somewhat rustic and a little bit curmudgeonly. And five or six different people gave them my name. I don't know which, because of which one of those attributes, I'm really not sure. <laughs> and um, they actually called me. And so uh, they used to a long time ago when people would do things like this, you'd have to, if they were going to a casting call, you'd have to go to wherever they were doing it at a hotel, at a, at a movie theater, you know, some sort of auditorium or somewhere. And they would interview a whole bunch of people. Now they just do it all on FaceTime. And uh, so they, they call me up on FaceTime. They sent me some things to read ahead of time. And, um, and and so they call you up they you know tell you to stand up look right look laugh you know sit down and shut up um stand up you know and um and uh so did all the things they asked and read the lines and that kind of stuff and and at the very end of the conversation just after everybody was saying goodbye and i heard some guy way back in the background noise say that's our guy and i thought oh yeah maybe i got this job it'd be fun and i absolutely had no idea what kind of money something like this would pay. I mean, I'd never even, I mean, they asked me to do it. I assumed there was money involved, um, but the money was incredibly good. Uh, they, they pay you per day for the time that you were working at filming. So they paid me for, you know, three days of my time, you know, all the time. Plus they gave you a, a daily per diem. Plus they paid for all your food and lodging and all those kinds of fun things. And, and then every time the ad shows, they, they go out in the Dubai's every time the ad shows and uh, you get a, you get a little ka in your bank account. So uh, this ended up being incredibly profitable to me. And I was, it was really exciting. And I, um, I, 
made a career change uh, about a year and a half ago now. I left Enchanted Hills and I went out and I purchased myself a um, big old uh, commercial building downtown Greenville, Tennessee. And the, the, the Subaru money really gave me gave me the ability to remodel the building. It was really it was really exciting, really exciting. So if you ever have the opportunity uh, to do something, go ahead, jump on it. It was it was a lot of fun. Um, the people, the ad agency that, that designed the ad and put the ad together, they were pretty they were pretty adamant about the fact that they really wanted a blind person to play because they wrote a blind person into the part. They really wanted a blind person to play the part. So, and and as we know from being blind people, that's relatively progressive thinking in the world. Uh, so that 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 part was pretty cool. Um, so. If I back up about, you know, 60 plus years, 65 years, uh, I was born in Saginaw, Michigan. Um, I came out of my mother's womb uh, with very, very bad vision. I have a hereditary eye disease, retinitis pigmentosis. Uh, I always jokingly told my mother I should have picked parents with better genes. And she says, I always wore Sears jeans. You mean I should have worn Calvin Klein's? <laughs> 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 so uh, I was lucky. I grew up on a farm. Uh, if you can walk and talk and breathe when you're on a farm, there's always something for you to do. Uh, I worked in the barn a lot, milk, learned how to milk cows and shovel the door and um, uh, baled hay, um, worked in the garden, canned beans, you know, uh, canned fruits, made jams, made jellies, did all those things. Um, started started changing diapers on other cousins probably by the time I was about seven or eight years old. So um, it, you you know that you're well accepted amongst your kin and relation and aunts and uncles when you get whooped right along with your cousins for doing something you shouldn't have done. <laughs> Not that that would have happened to me, but no. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, I was really fortunate. I went to a, a residential school for the blind, Michigan School for the Blind. I probably didn't think that I was fortunate that at the time that it happened, uh, I went to a regular elementary school for kindergarten and first and second grade. In my third grade year, I started at the School for the Blind, and then I went to the School for the Blind through my 11th grade year. And then I transferred to the, the local high school in our hometown, Traverse City High School, and graduated from there. But I went to the School for the Blind when they were actually probably at the pinnacle of their of their most effectiveness um the, the school you know had a lot of blind teachers uh it really believed in blind people um it's funny we think about all the things we do nowadays to get textbooks and and books um, made into braille and books put on, you know, tape and those kinds of things at the school for the blind. That stuff already existed. I mean, all the all, any, every book that we used in every class was available either in large print or braille or audio. I mean, every single one of them. I mean, there was no all the tests were given. You know, if you were a braille reader, all the tests were given in braille. Uh, if you were a large print reader, you got it all in large type. I mean, that was just that was the normal everyday thing. There was no special going out to the you know, the resource room trying to figure out how to make that happen. The thing that the School for the Blind taught me that, too, was that there's, there are no lines drawn by blindness. It's, a, it's an equal opportunity disease. So I had a little bit of everybody at the School for the Blind. So it was a relatively small population, but there was every ethnicity um, uh, there. So you, you learned, you learned, um, how to get along with everybody, you know. So that, that was a that was one of the things that uh, was probably a hidden benefit of of going there was the fact that you know we had a real diverse group of people and had to learn to get along with a real diverse group of people. Um, when you have just a brother and a sister that you have to um, deal with or something, it's pretty easy. But when you live and and work with, you know, have to work with, you know. You know, 200, 200 people, you know, other people at the school for <laughs> blind students every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You learn to become a little more tolerant of the world and you learn to have a, a lot of, um, I guess, respect for everybody's rights and privileges and those kinds of things. 
Um, so went there, took all the vocational classes that they had. Uh, I was not a big academia person. I, I would much rather spend my time in the wood shop or the metal shop or the small engine shop. And I took every single one of those classes that the school offered. Uh, when I went to Traverse City High School my senior year, uh, I wanted to take the auto shop class and the guy was a little bit skeptical and at the end of the the first week I was the I was the uh, auto shop teacher's assistant because uh, <laughs> I had I'd had so much experience with it and I'd already been working uh, I worked the whole summer at a Volkswagen dealership in the in the engine shop rebuilding engines and everything between my junior and senior year um, I was a active sports person I wrestled all the way through high school got involved with um, cross-country skiing, um, bicycling, uh, backpacking, canoeing, um, and all of those things for a good portion of my life. Later in my life, I got involved in um, uh, competitive horseback riding, endurance rides, uh, broke and raised and trained uh, horses for about 10 years of my life. Um, I guess it was George, a little, been talk a little about... Under. T tell them the story about your cross-country skiing and also your canoe um, <laughs> competition. <laughs> okay. I, I took a little cross-country ski trip, uh, started in the Kola Peninsula in Russia and skied all the way across Norway, Finland, and Sweden, uh, a little over 500 miles. Uh, probably over half the trip was north of the Arctic Circle. Now, the warmest day we had was 32 degrees. The coldest day we had was 57 below zero. Uh, and then uh, the year before that, I had been involved with, um, I was on the US Paralympic um, cross country ski team and competed for the US and the ILO Norway and way back in the dark ages of 1980. <laughs> um, um, did some, <laughs> She was asking about the canoe trip. We, I went to um, a friend of mine and I signed up to compete in the in the local uh, canoe race they had every year in the town that I lived in. And I got there to the canoe race, and uh, this was before the age of cell phones or anything. And my partner um, didn't show up, and there was a, another lady there at the at the canoe race who um, who was there, and she was a competitive. Uh, canoe racer from Sweden and she she her partner didn't show up so we're standing there you know five minutes before the race start we both have numbers I had a canoe and everything there and she was standing there with her paddle and I she says well do you want a partner and I said well yeah let's go do that so we um the gun goes off we're you know paddling away and she's all of a sudden she's getting a little angry with me. She says, the buoy, it's further to the right, further to the right. Can't you see the buoy? And I go, no, I can't see the buoy. <laughs> she had no idea that I was blind. We, we'd known each other for, you know, less than, less than five minutes before we, the, the gun went off. And, and we just, I just never had time to get to that. We were talking more about canoe stra paddling strategies and who was going to captain and all those kinds of things. And, and I had already told her she had to be the navigator, but she just wasn't understanding that until we got to where the first buoy was. And then after that, it was just fine. And, and, um, uh, we got there was one portage uh, you had the portage over a dam and we get there and and um, they run the canoe up on shore and she says what are we doing now and I says we carry the canoe she says okay so we flip the canoe up above her head so we go you know, and she was in the front so she says well, how do you know where to go and I said I'm just gonna follow the canoe <laughs> because we're both holding on to the same canoe I gotta, I gotta go wherever it went so we went we went running down through this area and she and I said to her, now when you go around this next corner, there's a bunch of stairs. And she goes, what? And I said, clear enough, you turn the corner and there's a whole big flight of stairs. And we sort of throw in the canoe back and she goes, how you know there's stairs? And I says, I've been through here a hundred times, you know, I, I knew the route. So, but we took third place. It was really great. We'd never paddled before ever and took third place in the race. It was pretty fun. Um, did a lot of, uh, bicycling. I never have bicycled all the way across the country. I've bicycled from Missoula, Montana, all the way back to Michigan. Then I've also bicycled all the way around Lake Superior, which is about 1,500 miles. And uh, so spent a lot of time on the back of a tandem as a, as a stoker. Um, my, my career when I came out of high school, 
Um, I, was, I was a Volkswagen mechanic. I decided I didn't like getting dirty and grubby and greasy and was looking for something different to do. And so I started building some lawn furniture, me and a buddy of mine, uh, out of the basement of his house and uh, putting them out in the front yard for sale. And uh, a guy came along and bought two chairs one day. And then two weeks later, he came back and he bought 100 chairs. And I was in the woodworking business. It just pure dumb luck. Um, I outgrew my buddy's basement instantaneously. Went looking for a place to put my shop. Put my shop in the basement of a commercial office building in downtown Traverse City. And my deal with the guy who owned the office building was I couldn't make any noise during the day because it was all offices above above the basement so one of them being the irs office you know you don't want to make them mad um, <laughs> so uh my deal for my rent for the building was that i i became the head janitor uh for the building i uh, every night i vacuumed all the halls cleaned all the bathrooms washed all the doors entry doors uh, down uh cleaned all the windows uh shoveled all the snow in the winter time um, was there for about two years, um, managed to uh, put enough money away in the bank in those two years to buy an old beat-up, decrepit building on the south end of town. Uh, it needed a new roof and windows and just incidental little things. And so I re-roofed <laughs> the building, re-roofed the building with myself and three friends and moved the machinery in and got up and working and was doing incredibly well. Went from you know, in the case of about eight years, went from a single man operation to having 10 full-time employees, um, doing a lot of commercial work, uh, bar and restaurant fixtures, bank teller lines, storefronts on buildings, um, did a huge restoration job, was the uh, one of the main contractors to restore the old county courthouse in our, in our town and did all of the mill work all the new millwork to match the old millwork for the restoration project. In um, 19, late 1982, the whole world came crashing down. Um, the interest rates went to uh, 20%. Um, the oil embargo came along at the same time. Um, and I had just built on an addition on my shop for a new finishing room and couldn't make the payments at the bank and lost everything I had. Uh, started over from absolute zero, moved from uh, northern Michigan to Hickory, North Carolina with all my possessions and I rode on the Greyhound bus. So that tells me how much stuff I had left in my <laughs> world. Um, went back to college, at uh, Catawba Valley College, uh, to get a degree in furniture production management. Uh, there's an interesting story there. I had searched through the country looking for different places that had furniture programs and found two or three different ones. And the one that the, in North Carolina was the one that appealed to me the most. Plus, it was right dead center of the middle of the furniture industry in the United States. Um, so I sent them my resume. I sent them my portfolio. They accepted me. They took my money. And I show up for the first day of classes and go into the guidance counselor's office and sit down. And our conversation had um, been in, in process for uh, less than three minutes. And he says, uh, are you blind? And I said, yep, I am. He goes, uh, do you understand what this program is about you know, what we do? And I said, that's why I'm here. He goes, you know, we run big industrial woodworking machinery, big stuff, you know, really dangerous stuff. And I said to the gentleman, I said to him, I said, I noticed when we shook hands, I says, I noticed you only had a thumb and one finger on your right hand. I says, how did that happen? He says, well, in a woodworking accident. And I, says, and I said, immediately said to him, I says, are you blind? And he goes, no, I'm not blind. I says, well, so blindness doesn't have anything to do with you cutting your fingers off. And uh, he, he didn't have much to say about that. And then my next <laughs> sentence line to him was that I'm only looking for the same opportunity to cut my fingers off as you had. And that was, <laughs> that was pretty much the end of the conversation about me and my blindness and, and running the machinery and everything. And, and I already knew that, you know, they took federal funding that, you know, they, they, there was no way that they could really keep me from taking their programs. They could make it really, really difficult for me, but they, um, they could never keep me from doing it. Um, 
I had to take a, this is a funny story about later on, I had to take a plant engineering class where you had to design a, a full, you know, a whole uh, uh, woodworking factory, you know, to, to manufacture a product. So they would assign you, they would assign you the product, then you had to engineer the factory, put all the machines in it, design all the dust collection and air system and, and product flow and all those kinds of things. So uh, on the one wall of the, of the lab, there was um, a 16 foot long by four foot tall bulletin board. So I covered that whole bulletin board with um, raised line graph paper and used um, push pins and string and yarn and uh, cut out little replicas of the machinery and that that I wanted to put on the out of cardboard that I wanted to put where on the in my furniture plant and lay out and design and we're into the end of the term probably about four weeks maybe five weeks about halfway in and all of a sudden the professor of the class says to the class he says well guys we seem to have a big problem here and, and I'm wondering oh geez now what's the problem and he goes it seems like everybody's design in the class is looking an awful lot like the one on the wall because <laughs> so, it was incredibly easy people could just it was huge you know people could just glance up from their from their drafting tables and look at <laughs> look at the design that i was putting on the wall and nowadays that would all be done you know all that today is all done on computers you know and, and so it would have actually made it harder for me today to to do those kinds of things because then how do you do the computer program? I, I would have still been stuck with trying to figure out how to do it, uh, you know, using old time methods. Uh, so I started my shop out in Traverse City, Michigan in the, in the early 1970s. I uh, ran it for about 10 years. After I went broke, I went to, the, to North Carolina, went back to college. When I was um, finished up, finishing up with the... It, at uh, the college, uh, some people hired me to um, to design and build a kitchen cabinet manufacturing plant, a small one. And I um, took on the task. I told the people it was going to take probably around you know a year and a half, eighteen months, somewhere in there, to uh, get it up and running. Um, so I bought all the machinery, uh, hired all the people, um, laid out the whole plant, got it up and running, was putting production out the door. And the uh, man who owned the furniture, you know, the operation who I was working for, we sat down to have our monthly, monthly meeting. Uh, and we had just, I'd, we had just landed a really nice contract with a condo developer to do all the kitchens in a new condo development. And I said, well, okay, it's, I've proven what I can do. I want more money. And uh, the Mr. Baxter, who was the head guy, you know, had all the money invested in it. He says, well, I'm not going to give you any more money yet. And I says, well, I've been here long enough. I said, I've been here a year and a half. I did everything I was going to do. You can see that I am competent in what I do. I says, you know, I've done every, absolutely everything I said I was going to do that from day one that we said we were going to do, I've accomplished. I said it was going to take about 18 months. It's taken me 19 months to do it. I says, but a month of that was tied up with the fact that one of the pieces of machinery we bought got hung up in customs. Uh, for about 60 days. The, for some reason, they did not want to release this piece of machinery that we bought from Sweden. Um, and uh, so we, we got pushed back about, well, it ended up pushing, us, pushing me back, I thought, about a month. So. But he, he, he was pretty uh, stubborn about it. He, he was not going to give me more money. And I'm, I'm more stubborn than he was because I picked up my, my notes off the desk and stood up and he said where are you going the meeting's not over and I said well, I, I'm done he goes what do you mean you're done I said yeah, I'm done I'm not and you won't pay me more money I want more money I'll, I'll go back to work for myself and uh, so I walked out the door and um, went on my merry way I uh, was looking around for something to do found a, a friend of mine who made router bits and tooling for the woodworking industry he was looking for a outside salesperson to sell his product I went to work for him uh, I stumbled into here again, just an incredibly just lucky thing. I found him a contract that would take up all of his production. And so, um, he, he came to me one day and he says, well, you know, he says, I don't, I really don't have a job for you anymore. He says, because I can't make any more than what you've already sold. He says, I, my contract, you know, he says, I, I have contracts for the next two years. 
And he says, you're more than welcome to keep your office. He says, but I, I really don't have anything for you. He says, you should just move on. And uh, I said, okay. So he, he, gave, he gave me my office, gave me the office that I was using to do whatever I wanted to do. Um, so I had an office to work out of and didn't know what I was going to do exactly. At about the same time, my mom happened to wander through town. And I had my dad's flag from when he passed away. Uh, he had been in World War II. And when you get a um, military funeral, they present uh, the widow or the survivors or whatever with a flag that they drape over the casket when they, when they do the funeral ceremony. So uh, my dad died back when I was 13 years old. So I was cleaning up some stuff at my house and my mom had stopped and and my dad's flag was laying on the coffee table in the, in the middle of the living room. And as, as moms can sometimes do to their children, uh, humble them into doing things, she said to me, she says, I don't understand. You've been in the woodworking business for your whole life. And she goes, you've never built a nice box to put that flag in. And I says, oh, you're right, mom. I've never done that. So I had a little free time so that the next morning I got up really, really early, which I have a tendency to do probably four o'clock in the morning. That's leftovers from milk and cows. And um, went out in the garage and uh, found some, found some uh, uh, cherry, some cherry lumber and um, made a, a really nice little box to put my dad's internal flag in and presented it to my mom the next day. And she said, oh, that you're such a good, you're such a good son. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> you know, however mom says whatever they're going to do to you. And uh, so I, um, uh, the very, very next day after mom left, a, a neighbor stops in with his, with his brother or brother-in-law, one or the other. And we're sitting there talking. And, and the guy says to me, he says, is that a, a box, flag box on your coffee table? And I said, yeah. He says, where did you get that? And I said, well, I made that. He goes, well, it's really strange. My brother-in-law or brother, whichever it was, owns a funeral home just down, you know, in the next town down the, down the road. He says, just last week, he asked me where I could buy or get someone to make boxes to put veterans internment flags in. He says, he says, we should go show it to him. And I says, when? He goes, well, what are you doing right now? And I said, nothing. So we went out and jumped in his truck and went and saw him and walked in the door Hadn't even hardly sat down, and the guy says, you making those? And I said, yeah. And he goes, I want six of them. I says, when? He goes, now. <laughs> and so uh, I turned right around, uh, went home, and got out some more lumber, uh, produced some boxes for him, and then produced some boxes to do uh, some photography with, to take some pictures, and then did a little bit of test marketing to see how it was going to market. Uh, found that they were incredibly easy to sell. One of the sad things about the whole thing was that the only way that people bought this product is if someone died. And if you went and looked at the statistics from the Veterans Administration, it was easy to see in the next, you know, five to 10 years, there was going to be about 3 million veterans who were going to pass away. And so the market for the product was excellent. And so I, I started marketing the product. I uh, was doing pretty well. Um, I worked it up to a, a place where I just landed a, um, a contract with the federal government, to, with, the, with the Army, to produce some flag cases for them. Uh, I, I was negotiating another contract with the Air Force to produce flag cases for them and came to the conclusion that I had nowhere near enough money to, to be able to manufacture you know, what I was selling. Uh, cash flow is king. If you have cash, you can do anything. Um, so I was looking for an investor. I found a local gentleman in town who had the resources to, to be an investor. And I, we were down to the very, very last meeting, I thought, with him. And, and uh, we sit down for the last negotiation, or what I think is the last negotiation. And he goes, well, I've decided I don't want to invest in your company. He, I just spent a huge amount of time putting this whole deal together. And he says, but I'll buy it from you. How much you want for it? And I just threw some stupid number out on the table off the top of my head. He says, well, I'll think about it. So the next morning he calls me up. He says, okay, I'll buy your company. Never, never counter offered nothing. Just I'll buy your company. So I owned my little flag case company for three years and three days. When I sold it to him, I had 2,500 accounts coast to coast. Um, several years after I sold the company to him, he, 
uh, had a little write up in the local newspaper and they were kind enough to mention my name and um, he sent it to me and the, they it was talking about them selling their millionth flag box so I was I was pretty pretty proud of myself to have they manufactured, designed, and marketed something that sold over a million units. Uh, I still think that's cool to this very day. Um, so I sold my flag case company, uh, was hanging around in Hickory, North Carolina. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, I uh, was in the, baking, <laughs> in the baking business, and I built her a couple bakeries. Uh, um, and her and I had a difference of opinion, and I moved back to Michigan and started up a kitchen cabinet um, company designing kitchens and making and manufacturing countertops for for kitchens um, that was do that did really really well i did well enough that i got managed to get my picture of one of my designs on the front of furniture uh the kitchen design and manufacturing magazine i sent i sent um pictures of a a kitchen that we had done into their little design competition and I managed to I didn't win first place but I got my picture on the front cover which made me happy and the guy who didn't get his who won first place didn't get his picture on the front cover and he was mad <laughs> he was a sore winner I tell you uh, um, so the in the um the economy in the state of Michigan started going way downhill again back in this their early two um, right around 2003 2004 uh, I saw the writing on the wall this time and I, I bailed early I, I just closed down my shop and started looking for something to do uh, went to work for opportunities unlimited for the blind and ran a um, camp for blind kids in Michigan for about five years, similar to what EHC runs uh, there in California. Um, and by 2009, 2010, the um, economy had gotten so bad in the state of Michigan, there was just no money left to do anything. So we closed down the camp and um, I went, I got recruited by uh, Blind Incorporated, which is a private rehabilitation center in Minneapolis, Minnesota to come be their industrial arts teacher. Went there, uh, worked there for them about two years, I guess. And the, the management and I, because George is pretty pig-headed, didn't get along real well, so I quit. And um, I, I had already set up a small woodworking shop, my own in Minneapolis. Was doing some uh, architectural millwork restoration for um, people who were renovating old houses who wanted uh, a piece of millwork to match something that was on the house that, from when it was built back in the you know 1800s and early 1900s I was doing doing okay with that uh, and then um, um, the people at Enchanted Hills Tony Fletcher he sends me a letter one day and he says we want to start a an art program at Enchanted Hills Camp with the Blind and want to restore this old grape crushing barn into art studios and those kinds of things. And he says, are you interested? And I said, well, wave some money in front of me. So he, he did. And I went out and uh, started up the program at Enchanted Hills. And that all did really fine and great until the, the fire came along and uh, burned down, you know, a third of the camp. And my job went from you know, doing what I love to do, which was the teaching and the running of the art programs and working on the art building and that to becoming the, the construction manager for the rebuilding process for uh, redoing the camp. And my job went from my nice cushy, you know, 35 to 40 hours a week to 70 hours a week. And it, it boils down to money and time. And they didn't want to give me any more money. So I didn't want to give them any more time. So uh, them and I went separate directions. Um, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life. I didn't think I was ready to die quite yet. Uh, so I started looking around uh, for a, a place to move. Uh, my dream when I was 19 years old was to uh, own a building where that I could uh, have my residence in, have uh, an art gallery in, slash furniture gallery and my wood shop all in the same building. So I started looking around the country for different places and I had lived in North Carolina um, 
lived in North Carolina for those 15 years. Alexa, so, off. so I liked the, I liked the, um, the area. So I started looking around in North Carolina and Tennessee and Kentucky and Virginia and just started looking at all the little towns until I found a building that met my criteria and bought an old beat up building right downtown in this little town of Greenville, Tennessee. And um, it only had a, it had a few problems. Needed a new roof, needed new windows, didn't have any electrical service. The plumbing was shot. But besides that, it's a really nice building. <laughs> and I've spent the last year and a half fixing all those things up. I have a new roof now, new plumbing, new electrical service, uh, new heat and air conditioning in the building. Have restored the whole front of the building and rebuilt the, the storefront on it. it. It's starting to look like it belongs here. Uh, so that, that has occupied my last year and a half. Um, I've done a few other things I missed talking about yesterday. I was involved in a, in a documentary film process um, for, it's called Mary's Journey. It's a documentary film about a lady who dies at age 24 uh, of sarcoma cancer. And she was, she was from Michigan. There was this really cool uh, little book that was written back in the 1940s, early 50s. It's called Paddle to the Sea. And it was about a young American Indian boy who carves a little canoe with a little Indian in it. And he puts it on the shore of Lake Superior in the springtime. And the book, the book documents the, the journey of the, of the little boat from Lake Superior all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean. And on the bottom of the boat, the, the young young boy writes on it, my name is Paddle. Uh, I'm trying to get to the sea. If you find me along the way, please put me back on my journey. And so Mary Kent, who uh, figured out that she was dying from cancer, one of her dreams on her bucket list was to, at some point in time, make that same journey that Paddle did from Lake Superior all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean. When she figured out that she was not going to be able to make that journey, uh, she asked my friend Keith Famey if he uh, could put her ashes in a, in a boat and have it make the journey. And he goes, um, 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 I, I don't know how to do that. And uh, she says, well, you know, I want to make the same journey that Paddle made. So he calls me up and says, can you build me a boat that will carry internment ashes from uh, Lake Michigan out to the Atlantic Ocean? I said, well, sure I can. So I went and met with Mary Kent um, before she passed away and sat down with her at the Keith's uh, library table. And I had a big chunk of styrofoam and I carved her a model of the boat uh, the way she wanted it to look. And I uh, went back to my shop and sadly, two weeks before I finished the boat, Mary had passed away. But Keith went on and made the video, uh, the documentary film, and it's a, a non-linear film, but it, it documents the last 10 or 11 months of Mary Kent's life. And then it keeps going back and forth between what is happening with her and her struggle to the, the boat that I made making its journey uh, from Lake Michigan out to the Atlantic Ocean. So that was a lot of fun um, uh, being involved. But the story is sad, but the, the, the story is as much about Mary Kent and her struggle as it is with many people's struggle with cancer and the, um, and the interaction between the, the people and the boat as it makes its journey is just absolutely incredible. There's all these things that are just appear to be purely coincidental between people seeing the boat and then them talking about their friends who have had struggles with cancer and different things. It was, it's very, it was very touching. It was, it was a, I liked doing that project. Um, my biggest and newest and most fantastic project that I'm just getting started into and would have already started if it hadn't been for this COVID-19 mess. Um, one of my dreams about 10 years ago or so was to build a reproduction of one of Helen Keller's, Helen Keller's desk. And um, so I've been slowly but surely putting this project together. We had it all ready to uh, have the big blast off uh, party for it and everything at the American Foundation for the Blind Conference uh, in May. 
uh, first, I'm sorry, first week of April this year, and then the whole thing fell apart and they canceled their conference. So we never, never got it up and off the ground at this point in time, but we're still going to do that uh, through my shop here in, uh, in Greenville, we're going to build a hundred replicas of, um, of Helen Keller's desk and we're going to sell them. We're going to take the proceeds to start a, a, um, a scholarship program through American Foundation for the Blind slash Maring Printing House for the Blind that will help give people money to people who want to take non-traditional things to earn a living. People who want to become woodworkers, people who want to become potters, people who want to become artists, people who want to become sculptors, you know, weavers, um, bee raisers, all the things that rehab services are quite unwilling to fund. That's, that's my goal with it. So that's me in a nutshell, in, a, in as fast as I could tell you a 60-year-old a, a story. In, 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 in a half hour. <laughs> wow. Well, that's, that's, um, it's a wonderful story. And I think for a lot of people of you that are new at vision loss, hopefully it made you aware of the possibilities and that you, if you have a passion for something, it is possible. So what I'd like to do now is open it up to questions, but please say your name first, and then I and then I will call on you if you have a question. Anybody have a question for George? Steven. Come, Aiden, come on. I'm just wondering how you... I'm a new, newly blind person. I'm kind of figuring... I used to be an artist before my blindness. Just kind of wondering... For instance, how do you figure out how you're dimensioning or cutting or creating a project such um, as a desk? Well, measuring is very simple. Um, there are <laughs> there is there is a ruler out on the market called a click rule, which I use religiously. Uh, it's a tactile ruler. It's incredibly accurate. It's very simple to use. Uh, they sell them at the um, at the store at the in San Francisco at the Lighthouse. They're called click rules. Um, they're really easy to use. Um, have you ever looked um, for other blind artists that are out there in the world? There's a deafblind deaf blind artist out of New York City who's a good friend of mine. Matter of fact, when I worked in Minneapolis, uh, she, became, she became a student of mine. Her name is Emily Gassio. Um, she, is, she has the most listened to program on audio lab that they've ever done uh, about her story of her life. Her life is kind of interesting. She decided when she was 13 or 14 years old, she wanted to be an artist. She decided she wanted to go to the Cooper union, which is the last totally free art school that's left the United States. It's in New York city. If, you, if they decide you're good enough to go to school there, you get to go to school there. She, mm. she got to go to school there. Uh, she had a small hearing problem as a younger adult and uh, when she was in her junior year at um, at the Cooper Union she was sitting on her bicycle on a corner and a truck came around the corner and knocked her off she landed on her head lost all of her vision and lost all of her hearing uh, she now has a cochlear implant and she is just now getting her um, doctoral degree in, in art of some sort but she is a sculptor, and she's had some pretty successful shows around the around the country and around the world. Um, I did a I did a show with her in uh, L.A. Um, I'm sorry, in San Francisco, um, at an art gallery there once upon a time, and and she's done shows in London, shows in New York City, shows in Chicago. Um, she's 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 a pretty amazing artist. Her, she's 26, 27 years old, uh, absolutely refuses to take no for an answer. Uh, and she will tell you the same thing that I say about it is that art and your ability to design and your ability to envision is not in your eyeballs, it's in your brain. You just have to find a way to, um, to get those, you know, processes out through your fingers now instead of out through your eyes. Right. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, George, there was a, 
actually my client who asked me a question after, and uh -huh. um, she was too shy to ask it during the seminar. And this kind of fits in with his question. She said, well, how can you produce something if you can't see it? And so, yeah. you know, we had a conversation about how we see with our hands and how yeah. that doesn't really miss anything because our brains and our hands are well connected and you can um, get the same mental picture in your head through your hands that you can through your eyes um, from an object by touching an object. You know, some of the really famous sculptures, um, uh, Michelangelo, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, both of them, they, um, they would go to the, to the butcher shops and they would um, strip the hides back off of animals uh, and run their hands up and down the, the muscular structure of the, of the animals. And um, the, even say that they, they did it at mortuaries and did it to people as well because they wanted, when you touched their sculptures and when you hand, ran your ar hands up and down the arms and legs of their sculptures, they wanted you to be able to feel the muscle structure underneath, uh, underneath in the marble, you know, in the granite or whatever, there, or in the bronze or whatever they were doing. And I, I have had the opportunity in my life to look at some of these sculptures and be able to touch them and everything. And it is so very true. Um, there is a huge sculpture of a horse in Grand Rapids, Michigan at the Meyer Garden Sculpture Park and having raised horses and everything. You, you walk up to this bronze statue of this horse and you run your hands down the, down the legs of, the, of, the, of this horse. And it, it is exactly like you're feeling the horse, the, the, the muscles underneath the skin. Are, you can feel them. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And that's, that's all non-visual. I mean, that is purely 100% tactile. You know, to that end, um, it's an interesting example that you gave um, when I was taking the horse husbandry program at Sierra College. Um, we went out to do confirmation, and so we went out to the instructor's ranch, and she brought out some horses, and we were supposed to um, find their confirmation faults, and um, most of the, the students would stand there and just look and they would miss a lot and of course i was running my hands over the horse and i would discover the things that they were not seeing oh, yeah. mm -hmm. any it other is, questions it has been my observation in life that almost all things that feel uh, beautiful inviting uh, sensual in your hands are also the same way to the people's eye yes Yes. Any Indeed. other questions? Indeed. It's me, Stephen, again. I just have just a bunch mm -hmm. of technical questions. Go I, for it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a lot, but maybe like for one, like if say you're creating a desk, how do you keep it even on the tops and not, if you put a marble on it, it doesn't roll up like it's not supposed to. <laughs> you build it square <laughs> and level. <laughs> So talk, yeah, about, but, talk about the accessible tools, George. That's what I meant, the tools. I, yeah. I have so few tools that are, quote, unquote, blind people tools. I mean, just so few. Um, I, use, um, uh, I, I use a level uh, lots of times in my shop that is the same level that the uh, Romans used to use, which is just a piece of, you know, angle iron now you know the one i have nowadays is a piece of angle iron that has a foot on one end so it'll sit flat up on its corner and that you it has a large ball bearing in it and you set that on any surface and you can see which way things roll uh which way the marble rolls in the in the in the frame uh, <laughs> that, that technology is about four thousand years old i think but uh, it works um, and it works mm -hmm. today just as good as it worked <laughs> back then. Um, you are now blessed with modern technology. And in your iPhone, there is an incredible level in your iPhone. Yes, there is. <laughs> I mean, it works perfect. I mean, uh, I, I was leveling concrete farms with mine this summer. 
And people <laughs> laughed at me when I pulled out my phone and laid it on the on the concrete for him. They said, what are you doing? I said, you know, it's level. And the guy goes, what? And I said, yeah, there's a level in here. And he goes, you're shitting me. I'm, 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 I mean, he says, <laughs> and, okay. and I says, he goes, I says, See, there is. And he pulls his phone out and starts looking. He's, oh my God, there is a level in here. And so, and, you know, there are some pretty cool things out. There's some audio output tape measures. Um, tape King, I think, is the one that's out there right now that's probably the best one. Um, and they're pretty good. I mean, they will get you close. They're, they're not as good a technology as the click rule is. It's in the phone. Um, it's seriously pull out my level. Hello. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah it's, in, it's, in your, it's in your phone. It's under... It used to be in with the compass. Now I think it's under, what's it called? It's where the measurements and everything is. There's, a, there's also a, a, a measuring device in there. I haven't fussed with it too much. Um, my brother says it works pretty good. My brother's also blind. And uh, he says it works pretty good, but I've never fussed with, you have to you put it at one, you put it at one point, you double tap on the screen, you slide it to the next point, and it'll tell you what the distance is in between. Um, but I've never fussed with it. I, um, there's um, there's a company that makes a uh, audio output. Um, it, it's made for the, the the rest of the sighted world, but it it uh, reads out reads out to your iPhone. There's one of your calipers that read out to your iPhones. There's micrometers that read right out to your iPhone. Um, uh, protractors that read right out to your iPhone. Um, I mean, so there's some really cool stuff out there that's never existed before that you just had to figure out how to how to work around. My problem is figuring out how to locate it or figure out yeah. if they even exist. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is a uh, 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 internet group called WW Numeral 4B, which is Woodworkers for the Blind. And if you, those guys on that, there's probably a couple hundred people from around the world that belong to that. And uh, if you have any question about how to do any kind of measuring or those kinds of things or what tools are out there to do, you know, what kind of tools are out there for blind people to use, if you put a question up on that website, I, on that uh, internet page, I guarantee you'll get an answer back because there's some, there's some really sharp guys on that website. Numeral 4B? Yeah, WW. And then the number four B. Okay. W W four B. Yep. Yeah. There's there's some smart guys on there. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, as, of, <laughs> as of this fall, uh, I'm going to start teaching out of my facility. So uh, if you're interested in in going somewhere and taking you know classes and in, in what you want to do, I don't claim to be any kind of uh, world class artist. I am a, a technical resource. I can, you tell me what you want to do. I'll teach you how to build it. I can't, I can't pull your sculpture out of your brain though. Not can. I'm, a, <laughs> I'm, a, technical, I'm a technical artist. So. Uh -huh. um, and just so you all know, um, NFB is a really good resource for um, specialty interests. So they have a lot of divisions that, address specific interests. Um, for example, uh, many years ago, I started the agricultural and equestrian division. There's school teachers division, there's diabetics division, there's blind lawyers division, there's art division. So um, it's a good resource for connecting with people that are into what you're into. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've been, I, I, I didn't talk about it much, but I, I've done, um, two international art shows now which is in my opinion is just incredibly cool i, I mean people that picked me uh the first one i was in the first one that i was in was at the detroit museum of contemporary art i was one of 20 artists that were picked to to have a show that was up there for six months i guess but that was really kind of cool because the the people who who put this show together they Sorry, went around to different artists around the country who were very well known and they said go out in your community and find some artists that you think are worthy of being in this show 
So the, the guy that chose me, his name is Alex Soth. He's a world famous photographer. And, um, but he sent his assistant out into the community to look for artists that, that they thought you know, jointly should be in this show. And his, his whole thing to her was, he said, bring me back samples and photos of their work, but I don't want to know who they are. I don't want to know anything about them. I just want to look at their work. So uh, he chose me out of a group of, you know, a couple hundred artists in Minneapolis that they looked at purely based on my work. He didn't have a clue who I was. He did not know I was blind. He knew nothing about me. He picked it just purely on what he saw in the, in the photos and, and things that his assistant brought back to him. And that, that, that was my first indication um, to me that I had good tangible evidence of that uh, I was not necessarily a, a good artist because people felt sorry for me because I was blind, that I was a good artist because people looked at my work and thought it was worthy. And since then I've done another, I did another show uh, in LA at the um, uh, Pacific Design Center in LA, which is the biggest design center in the world. Uh, did a big show there. It was the best show I've ever done as far as quantity of work that I sold. Um, I've done some other shows, done a show in Milwaukee, um, done a show in Chicago, uh, did it just recently did a show up in uh, Washington DC, Baltimore uh, area up there. Um, and all those things have come crashing to a halt. So I don't know what's going to happen next. But one of my goals in, in, in my gallery here that I'm developing in my, in my building here is to bring in different artists from around the world. I'm, I'm calling my, my gallery a haptic gallery. And that's, that's the discovery of things with your hands, you know. The, the, uh, so uh, I, will probably, I will probably do some photography shows and some, and some um, paintings and those kinds of things. But I'm going to concentrate on sculpture and furniture and a lot of furniture, a lot of sculpture and a lot of furniture is what my gallery is going to concentrate on. Cool. Very good. Any other questions? That's the quietest it's been the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, George, for doing this twice. I really appreciate it. I think um, it gave a lot of insight to some folks that are new at all this. You have, you have things at your fingertips today that, you know, that you can access that were non-existent, you know, when I started off doing what I was doing in the world. If you wanted to know something from somebody, you either had to pick up a phone and call them or write them a letter and put a stamp on the envelope and put it in the mailbox. Uh, if you wanted technical information, the, the source for technical information, you know, was, was trade, trade journals and manuals and books and everything. Nowadays, you can look anything up on the Internet. You can find a YouTube video to do darn near anything you want to do in the world or, or see how someone else thinks that it should be done, uh, which may, you know, give you ideas of your own. Um, the, the, the opportunities to do, you know, whatever you want to do, are driven by you. Uh, you shouldn't let people uh, tell you what to do who don't have to live off the fruits of your, of your labor. Uh, I've always thought that. Um, and the best thing you can do for yourself if you want to try to do something is learn how to be the best you can be at it. I, I listened to an Eric Clapton interview one time and someone asked him, you know, how he became such an amazing guitar player. And he says, I practiced 16 hours a day for three years straight before I thought I was worthy to go out and look for a job working in a band. And I mean, that's the kind of dedication it takes. I mean, I, I, I am good at, I am good at what I do for a living uh, because I've been doing it for, you know, 45 plus years. I've dedicated my life to what I love and what I want to do. Uh, I've been very unwilling to take no for an answer. I've been very pig headed my whole life and done what I wanted to do. I, um, I don't, I, I don't suffer fools. Well, um, <laughs> I've, I, I've been fired from every good job I've ever had in my whole life or quit or a combination of the two that they were happy to see me go. And I wanted to leave. Um, so you, you have to decide, you know, what's important to you. You know, do you want to work for the man? Do you want to work for yourself? If you want to work for yourself, you better understand you're going to work harder. You're going to work longer and for less money than you would have if you worked for somebody else. 
If you work for somebody else, you get up in the morning, you don't feel you don't feel real ambitious. You go to work, you still get a paycheck. If you work for yourself and you don't feel that very ambitious in the morning, you don't work very hard. You don't have any money at the end of the day. So you're, you, you have to be, you have to become motivated if you want to do things for yourselves. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much, George. And uh, let us know how your projects and, and your upcoming classes are. Okay, my website is uh, gmwurzel.com, um, and then I have a, a Facebook page as well that's just George Wurzel, and there's a, another Facebook page out there that is uh, jo George the Subaru guy that has all the photos of all, of all the restoration of my building. I figured they financed it, they ought to be able to look at it, so. <laughs> there you go. George? And that'll, that'll be some good practice for folks in their computer classes. There you go. George, can I ask a yeah. question? This is Steve George. Your uh -huh. last name Wurzel, W-E-R? W-U-R-T-Z-E-L. And feel, feel, free to, feel free to contact me. I'm easy to, I'm easy to find. If you, Google, if you Google me, I come up at the top of the page. <laughs> awesome. That makes it easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a appreciate, statement. Appreciate your story. Thank you. Can so, I make a statement here? Uh-huh. Sure. Yeah. Uh, George? Yes, sir. You, you know, you are a incredible human being. Oh, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> well, no, no, really. I, I listened to your story, and uh, you just showed me there's no excuses, and the blindness is not really a handicap. It's just we just have that that little infraction, but we can move on with our life. But I, I want to thank you uh, for sharing your story, and uh, I really appreciate it, man. Yeah, I, I, I strongly believe if you can't go over it, go under it. If you can't go under it, go around it. And if that doesn't work, blow it up. <laughs> there you yeah. go. I like it. <laughs>